Hello everyone and welcome to Merlin's Manor. Today I am previewing a game that's coming soon to Kickstarter called Chateau, designed by Martin Van Rossum and published by Rolling Rhino Games. This game is advertised as 1 to 99 players because it's a roll and write kind of game. Uh, right now they don't currently have the solo mode set up, but it is a stretch goal on the Kickstarter. Now Chateau, as I said, is a roll and write game that offers a different puzzle to solve each game. The game has you drawing polyomino shapes onto your unique chateau board as you attempt to be the first architect to fully construct your blueprint by filling all the squares on your board. Now the game plays quickly. Our games took between 10 and 15 minutes each time that we played. There are five different chateau boards with the base game and a total of 11 boards if you have both the UK and Scandinavian expansions. Each board has a different shape for the building that you are trying to fill in, and each board offers a different player power. So, uh, so let's, real quick, a summary of the game mechanisms you're going to find in this game. It's a roll and write game, it's a polyomino game, and it has variable player powers. Let's go ahead and look at how the game plays, and then I'll get into my review. Okay, so each person gets a different chateau to build and has a different power they can use. They'll read out aloud from the rule book what that power is so that everyone knows their board power. And there's a reminder here in the corner with a symbology here to show you what your power does. Then everyone passes their chateau board to the player on their right, who will then draw a starting shape of five squares anywhere on their opponent's board, except they cannot cover a hammer icon. So here are your hammer icons. You cannot cover those. So let's just say they would do something like this and then pass the board back. And it can be, again, anywhere as long as it's not covering that hammer icon. Then you begin by rolling two dice. And then each round you'll roll as two dice and you'll fill in the appropriate shape. Now if a one is rolled, you immediately pass your chateau board to the right. And your opponent marks off one square anywhere on your board that does not have a hammer icon. So that could they could just decide that they want to put it in the middle of everywhere there. How about that? And then you'll get it back and you'll resolve the other dice. Now when a 2 through 5 is rolled, you draw one of your corresponding shapes that are listed on the left side of your board. Here we have um, a 2 would be these two here, a 3 would be this little 3 shape here. If it's a 4 rolled, you do one of these. If it's a 5 rolled, you do one of those. Now you draw these shapes on your board and they must not overlap areas that have already been filled and you must be able to draw the entire shape in that area. Shapes can be rotated, mirrored, or flipped in any direction. Note I find the easiest way to draw these shapes is to simply cross off spaces. And so if, I, if a two is rolled, I would just go ahead and maybe cross off this space and this space, for instance. If a three is rolled, maybe I'd come up here. I might do this, and this is not at all strategic, but I'm just kind of showing you here. And they do not have to be adjacent. Now twos and threes are blue on the legend and these shapes are used over and over again. Now fours and fives are red on the legend and to demonstrate that you can only use each shape once, you cross out the shape. So let's say I were to draw, there was a four rolled and I would draw four right here like this. I would then cross off that shape. Now one, one, one of the chateau boards does have a power that lets you use your four and five shapes over and over again. There's actually specific shapes there and you will do those more than once. Now if a six is rolled, then you pick one item icon and you may cross off all squares that contain that item icon. For example, you might choose to do the treasure chest. And so cross off that one, cross off that one. And I believe that's all the treasure chests that were available. I'd already crossed that one off earlier, so it's already done. Now, if you cannot or do not wish to use the die result, unless that result is one, because one you are going to automatically have to pass to your opponents, then you can mark off a single space anywhere on your board. So let's say a late game, and I didn't really want to use the six for that icon. I, and let's, let's assume I have this, this area of, or here already crossed off. I could go in here. And just do that. It'd be a handy way to get rid of one space there. Now, of course, late in the game, you may not be able to draw a certain shape, and you'll have to do that. Whenever you cross off a hammer, let's say I were to draw a shape right here. Let's just do a two right there. Then you can use that hammer to fill in one space anywhere on your board. 
And let's say I were to fill in another hammer doing that, I could then chain that to do yet another space. And so I could just draw another one right there. The game ends when someone has completed their board, that player is the winner. In the case of a tie, the player that only had to use one die in the final round wins. And if there's still a tie, the tied players share the victory. Okay, let's get to the review of the game now. First of all, as far as ease of access goes, it is very easy to learn. Our nine-year-old picked it up very quickly. And since your choices are rather limited on each turn, I feel there's little room for analysis paralysis. So it's a great game for those who are casual gamers and just getting into the hobby, or those who just don't like to have too much going on that they have to think about too much. Uh, very easy to get into and learn, but there is some strategy involved in the game. Now let's talk about the gameplay. Each game offers a fun puzzle to solve. There's a lot of chance involved when it comes to what is rolled, but there's also a lot of player agency in choosing where you are going to draw your shapes and which four and five shapes you choose to use when a four or five is rolled, as well as which icons you cover up with drawn shapes and which ones you choose to leave uncovered, hoping to cover them using a six. You also have to be careful not to cut yourself off from being able to use the larger shapes, not only by where you place your shapes, but also by choosing to use a six to cover over icons. Since all two to six dice results are optional, you may even find yourself foregoing the use of the six power in order to not block yourself off, and instead use that result to fill a one by one area that has been formed. I also find, found that when, what the 6 does with allowing you to choose an icon and cover all of that icon to be a bit unique of a gameplay element to give this game a little something extra to set it apart from other polyomino games. Now player interaction is typically more minor than it sounds when you're first looking at the rules. The first placement during setup will only go so far in providing difficulty for your opponent. And the one squares later can be used to make things more difficult for your opponent, especially in the mid to later games, but can be only a minor nuisance in the early game. And super late in the game, you may just wind up filling one of your opponent's final one by one areas as they are trying to do the last stretch to complete their board. Now I will say the filling in spaces on your opponent's board was my least favorite part of the game, as I'm not big on take that mechanics. And I also found it difficult to quickly decide on a good place to put that five square shape at the beginning of the game and the single squares during the game. I'm not as familiar with their board and what they're working towards and you just kind of taking a quick look at it and trying to figure out where you're going to put that square. And so it wasn't as easy to figure that out, uh, but it still uh, works well to kind of give you a little bit of player interaction there. Now, as far as I could tell in my handful of playthroughs, the player powers and boards are well balanced Stronger powers tending to be paired with larger or more difficult to fill boards. Uh, the end game is simply a race to finish your building, which is not my favorite style of game, but with how quickly this game plays, I believe it works well. And generally there is some tension to the end game as you know others are getting close, but you know that you are just a couple rounds away as well. Uh, sometimes race to finish games can have a person that finishes before you felt like you were even getting close. Well, that's not the case in this game. There's a lot of tension as it's coming down to the finish there. And so I enjoy the gameplay in this game very well. Now let's talk about the art and components. Keep in mind this is a preview, so I don't know what the final product is going to be like. So there may be some changes to the components by the end. Now I like the artwork as well as the board design. The back side of the player boards have beautifully drawn historical landmarks with a nice touch including the date that they were constructed in the midst of a flag banner for the country it is in. I found the board side to be well laid out and useful as it gives the shapes you draw for each number a reminder of what the hammer does and an icon indicating your player power. Although you really do need to read most of them from the rule book because very few did I find intuitive. Although with time the icons may be enough to remind me what each player power is. Now as far as the theme goes, I find the theme itself nice and it fits well with the roll and write and polyomino game mechanisms. However, I do not find the theme to fully fit in with what you are doing. There is a decent amount of abstractness in what you are actually doing in the designing of your blueprint that as far as I can tell did not entirely flesh out the theme. But I don't feel this takes away from the game as the gameplay stands on its own without the need for the theme to be stronger in the way the game is played out. Now let's talk about replayability. 
The game seems like it could have a decent amount of replayability, given that there are 11 different buildings with different powers. And on top of that variability, the randomness from the dice rolls really make each game feel different. Add to this that the game plays very quickly, and I can see this game getting to the table a lot, as it can be set up and played in about 15 minutes. Final thoughts. Chateau is a quick, easy-to-learn, roll-and-write game that offers a different, fun puzzle to solve each game. The fact that this game plays in under 15 minutes not only could lead to this game getting to the table more often, but may even lead to it being played two or three or even more times in a single sitting. This game is also one that I can see being played with many different people, including casual gamers, and so opportunities to play this game could be quite large for those who enjoy roll-and-write games as well as puzzly polyomino games. The game is simple and straightforward and doesn't try to do too much. Therefore, I recommend this game if you enjoy roll-and-writes and if you enjoy polyomino games. If you like to have games that are puzzly in nature, I, I recommend this game as long as you are not adverse to quite a bit of chance in what's being rolled. As always, I hope you have enjoyed this video. It's given you something to think about. And as always, I'll catch you in the next video.